When the United States entered World War I in 1917, many American women were still fighting for the right to vote. President Woodrow Wilson found himself needing to sell a war to a country reluctant to engage in a conflict on foreign soil. Government and industry had to focus on the immense needs of the war effort. For the first time in history, the government created a propaganda agency to popularize the war. Propaganda materials were carefully crafted and far-reaching, urging every man, woman, and child to do their part for the war. Women were directly targeted and encouraged to support the war effort by working as nurses abroad or working on the home front in a variety of positions previously held by men. When the U.S. entered the war, Army Surgeon General Dr. William Gorgas sent registration forms to every physician in the country. Many women physicians responded, wanting to serve in the Medical Reserve Corps, only to find their applications decline. To women physicians, the war presented a unique opportunity. In December 1917, Dr. Frances Van Gaskin addressed students and faculty at the Women's Medical College of Pennsylvania. Today, we are overlooking the promised land. It is for you to enter this land of equal opportunity. It does not take a profit to read the writing on the wall for the woman of today. Here is work. Here is opportunity. Here is equality of reward. The war that has opened Pandora's box has also set free hope. And when the world is made safe for democracy, democracy will be made safe for women. The demand for women physicians is, and will be constantly, an increasing one. The recently founded Medical Women's National Association provided a forum for women physicians to advocate for change. Their second annual meeting featured Dr. Rosalie Slaughter Morton, former Special Commissioner of the Red Cross, Dr. Morton was appointed to chair the War Service Committee, and a resolution was passed, calling on the War Department to grant women physicians equal military opportunities. At the time, women physicians numbered less than 6% of all U.S. physicians, but despite their small numbers, an estimated 30% were eager to serve, a percentage that compared favorably to that of their male colleagues. In her autobiography, Dr. Morton wrote, in view of the fact that nearly all the women had dependents, aged parents, invalid relatives, brothers or sisters, nieces, nephews, or their own children to educate, their patriotism was the more evident in the assurance that almost everyone could be ready to sail within two weeks. Yet the Army refused to commission women physicians in the military, based in part on the fact that it hadn't been done, and a concern that women would have the authority to command men. Nurses, however, were considered official members of the service through the Army and Navy Nurses Corps. Women physician leaders nationwide challenged this policy. An Oregon woman recounted one bold attempt to enlist. We looked up the requirements very carefully and met them letter for letter. We armed ourselves with our certificates, our references, our diplomas from reputable universities, and a dozen other details. We had a sneaking hunch that we were not wanted, so we went over ready and armed to take the examinations, don the uniforms, and salute the privates. When asked if they would like to go overseas as nurses, they responded to the male physician, would you? Despite numerous petitions and challenges, in the end, all appeals for entrance into the Medical Reserve Corps were rejected. Colonel George E. Bushnell summarized the prevailing military view. Such a position is not befitting a woman. There are obvious reasons why it is not desirable that they should be called upon to examine large numbers of men stripped to the skin. There are few women who are physically qualified to endure the fatigues and vicissitudes of a campaign. Dr. Caroline Purnell, future commissioner of the American Women's Hospitals in France, held a different perspective. As a woman, and as a physician, and as a surgeon, I think our days of crawling are over. I cannot see why women should demonstrate their patriotism in any different way from men. If the men respect themselves and demonstrate their patriotism according to their training and experience, why should not women do the same thing? Our brains are not in our sex. 
Facing a personnel shortage, the U.S. military ultimately hired women physicians as contract surgeons to work at home and abroad. But contract surgeons were considered civilians and were paid a lower salary without military rank or benefits. Despite this inferior status, 56 women served as contract surgeons. 11 were assigned overseas, all anesthetists. The first contract surgeons to go overseas were Dr. Frances Edith Haynes with Presbyterian Hospital of Chicago and Dr. Anne Tomsland with Bellevue Hospital of New York. When their base hospitals were called overseas, the hospital commanders considered them to be irreplaceable and urged the Army to grant them appointments as contract surgeons. Dr. Esther Pohl Lovejoy, chair of the American Women's Hospitals, wrote, The men of the medical profession were called to the colors. The nation stood ready to provide transportation, buildings, medical and hospital supplies. The women of the medical profession were not called to the colors, but they decided to go anyway. Some women physicians found opportunities directly through military hospitals in Europe. Dr. Mary Merritt Crawford was one of the earliest to go overseas. In October 1914, she received funding to join the American Ambulance Hospital in Paris. In a poignant letter to her fiancé, Dr. Crawford wrote, The waste of life, the desolation of homes, the loss to the world and to individuals is too terrible. And what the women and children of France are suffering is unwritable. I can't think of it all for very long. It crushes me. I have to start to work and add my little help. And I can never look upon life the same again. An experience like this goes to the soul. Dr. Alice Weld Talent had offered her services to an American military hospital, but was politely turned away on account of her gender. Talent reported that the French military hospitals were hit so hard, they didn't care whether we were man, woman, or child. They welcomed us with open arms. Talent became an honorary lieutenant in the French Army Medical Corps, later receiving their highest honor. Dr. Harriet Rice was an African-American woman physician whose career had been limited by both her gender and race. Despite being 49 when the war began, she volunteered as a medical intern in France and was later awarded a bronze medal. War service brought her a level of professional honor that she would never receive at home. Dr. Jessie Fisher served abroad with the American Red Cross. In April 1918, Without her family's approval, she left her home, husband, and son behind in Middletown, Connecticut to do her part for the country. She recounts the experience in her diary. June 7, 1918. So far, my value to my country would not balance the sacrifice at home and the grand family row caused by my patriotic zeal. June 28, 1918. Major Moorhead introduces me as though it hurts him. Otherwise, he simply ignores my existence. I could ask for a transfer, but what would be the use? A woman has no business trying to butt into this military game. One has no rank or standing. I might as well pocket my pride and stick here. August 26, 1918. I have no thrilling stories to record. My firing line is the hospital, and my gun is a test tube, and my bullets, the deadly gas gangrene germs. So my colors are all borrowed, and my picture, a composite. One made up of stories picked up from lads. The first all-women's medical unit to go abroad was the Women's Overseas Hospitals, which was supported by the National American Women's Suffrage Association. A report on the female medical unit's arrival indicated that the surgeons were astonished to find only women. Women surgeons, they roared in indignation. But then wounded men arrived so fast that there was no time to think of men people or women people, just of human needs. Dr. Caroline S. Finley, the director, wrote, It is not only the most wonderful opportunity to serve our country, but also the first chance of its kind to serve the cause of women in just this way. The women proved their worth, and months later, Dr. Finley reported, we are now doing regular military surgery. 
Additional hospital units followed, including a unit dedicated to treating soldiers injured by gas warfare. The largest all-women's medical group was the American Women's Hospitals. Founded by the Medical Women's National Association, their first hospital opened in France in July 1918 under the direction of Dr. Barbara Hunt. Dr. Esther Pohl Lovejoy reported on the work of this unit during the typhoid epidemic. Calls came from every direction. The cars and ambulances were running day and night. And before the end of the epidemic, we were caring for the sick in over a hundred villages. The American Women's Hospitals registered more than a thousand women physicians during the first year. By November 1918, they had sent 78 women physicians overseas to work in hospitals, dispensaries, and ambulance units in collaboration with groups like the American Red Cross, the American Fund for French Wounded, and the American Committee for Devastated France. Lovejoy later reflected, This service has not been a bed of roses. Sometimes it has been a bed of straw in a box car, a rug on a deck of a sailing smack, or a cot in a typhus camp. Our hospitalers have endured discomforts, survived diseases and manifold dangers, but they have lived abundantly. They can never be poor, though they die in the almshouse. The place would be enriched by their presence. Women physicians also found other ways to contribute to the war effort. Dr. Marguerite Cockett co-founded an ambulance unit driven by women and helped establish one of the first YMCA canteens for American troops. The Smith College Relief Unit was composed of alumni, including two physicians, Dr. Alice Well Talent and Dr. Maud Kelly. As volunteers, they engaged in civilian relief work and were referred to by villagers as the good American ladies of Gricor. The war ended on November 11, 1918. Though the armistice was signed, women recognized that their work was far from over. Many remained overseas to help rebuild Europe in the post-war period. The number of women physicians who served at home and abroad is impossible to estimate. A prevailing sense of patriotism and desire to be of service fueled their commitment Perhaps Dr. Olga Stasny summed it up best. I want to get to France, even if I have to scrub floors. These are the unsung heroes of World War I. Women physicians with capabilities equal to their male colleagues who were not granted the same military privilege. Despite these barriers, they made lasting contributions both during the war and in the years that followed. Thank you.